We all know examples of helicopter parents. Maybe he applies for a job, doesn't get it, so his dad calls the hiring manager to ask what's up. Or maybe she doesn't make the cheerleading squad, so her mom calls the coach to complain. That's helicopter parenting, and it results in things like maybe resentment that their parents meddle in their every affair, or maybe entitlement, expecting other people to bail them out, and probably no taste of failure or the skills to deal with it. Guess what? God is not a helicopter parent, except sometimes we treat him that way. I think a big way that we can treat God as a helicopter parent is when it comes to discernment, especially of like big picture things. When it's like the little stuff we want to choose our own thing, like, you know, what do I eat? What degree should I pursue? Uh, where to work? And he lets us choose that. But when it's something like, you know, where should I go in life? Who should I marry? Things of that sort. We want him to just have this booming voice from heaven and tell us, but he won't do that because that would be helicopter parenting and he doesn't do that. I'm going to make a distinction. There's some things that kids can do, some things that kids can't do. And as they mature, obviously that, that'll change. Like, you know, a small, small child can't dress herself, but then later she can. So a good parent does the things that their kids can't do but does not do the things their kids can. That's what a helicopter parent does. They also do the things their kids can do. So let's take the example of a small child dressing herself. At two years old, can't dress herself. It is appropriate for her parents to dress her. And in fact, if her parents refuse to do that or refuse to do anything else that only the kids uh, that the kids could not do, that only the parents could do, you'd say, yeah, not great parents. But let's say that kid is now 10 or 20 and her parents insist on dressing her. That doesn't, that's not appropriate because she should be doing that for herself. And so by her parents doing something that she can and should be doing, she's robbed of that and doesn't learn the skill herself. So let's connect that with God. So if a good parent does the things their kids can't, but not the things their kids can or should, then how does this manifest with God? So let's take a, a few biblical examples. Redeeming us from sin is like the biggest one. We could not do that on our own, so he did it because only he could do it. Or ancient Israel rescuing them from slavery in Egypt, going through the Red Sea, the bread from heaven, only he could do it. Sometimes it's a mix. So like conquering the promised land, if God didn't tell the army to march out and they did anyway, then they would just totally lose. He had to march with them for them to be to grant victory, but he expected them to march out when he told them to. He wasn't just going to like hand wave and then here it is. So there was his part and there was their part. And I think the same is true for us in discernment. There's his part and our part. Now, our part is he's given us an intellect and a will, and he's given us clues as to what he wants each of us to do, such as, you know, our gifts and talents, needs we see in the world, our thoughts, feelings, and desires, maybe sometimes things other people say, like, hey, have you thought about this? But he's not going to, he probably won't, he might, but probably not be a booming voice from heaven. That'd be too helicopter parenty. But also he doesn't totally leave us to our own devices. That'd be more a negligent parent -y. So he does, you know, talk to us in prayer and things of that sort, but we also are expected to, to do our part. So the things that we can do and should do, he leaves for us to do. But the things we can't, the things that only he can do, he will do for us. The second area I'm going to look at for helicopter parenting is actions and consequences. Actions have consequences that arise from them. So for example, if you don't brush your teeth, you'll get a cavity. If you drive recklessly, even on icy roads, you'll probably end up in a ditch. And these are good ways to learn. Like I touched the hot stove, it burns. I'm not going to do that again. Now I'm going to make a distinction. Um, these are uh, consequences arising naturally from the, uh, the action. I'm not talking about manufactured consequences. Those are ones where like if, so natural one, if you're late to dinner, we'll start without you and your dinner will be cold when you come. Manufactured, if you're late to dinner, I'll throw it at you when you get here. That does not naturally arise. That's manipulative, coercive, that's bad. So not talking about those at all. So if natural consequences are how we learn, what happens when someone interrupts that cycle? So for example, if you don't study, if you don't show up to class, if things like that, you're probably not going to do so well. And so maybe you're about to fail a test, but a helicopter parent intervenes and gets a copy of the test ahead of time or talks to the professor or some sort of thing to bail you out. What happens in that case is you don't learn that no effort equals fail in a lot of cases. But a non-helicopter parent will allow those consequences. They probably won't let you get to that point in the first place saying like, hey, make sure to study. But as you grow and mature, allowing you the chance to fail. 
like you played video games all day and didn't study and now you got an F on the test. Let's talk about how you cannot get an F in the future and maybe you're banned from video games because it took away from study time. That I, was, I would argue is a natural consequence because the playing too much resulted in the not studying, resulted in the failed grade. It's not a manufactured thing. So how did God do it for ancient Israel? Well, basically Deuteronomy 28, which is his covenant as they're like about to enter the promised land, in a nutshell says, hey, if you follow me and are faithful to me, then I will bless you and I will give you this land. If you reject me, and basically you've spiritually exiled yourself from me, I will drive you out of the land, making physical the spiritual reality that's already there. And then later they did abandon him and he did exile them. Also, we see the same thing before that, like the entire book of Judges is a cycle of God blessing someone and then they get complacent and then they abandon him and then he delivers them to the hands of the enemies. They cry out to him. He rescues them. They get complacent and it just goes around and around. Also, the book of Judges is basically Game of Thrones, including incest and mayhem and murder and all of that stuff. So if anyone ever says the Bible's boring, they have not read the book of Judges very well. And we're back to talking about the exile. So... The whole point of the promised land was that this is a place where God will dwell with his people. And so if they reject him and they don't want to dwell with him, then the then they need to leave. But they're not going to because they want to enjoy the blessings without having the relationship at all. And so he drives them out. So the exile is actually a natural consequence for their actions. Like I said before, it's making physical a spiritual reality that was already there. Now in exile, they repent and he brings them back because now they want to dwell with him again, so he returns them to that land. That's how God did it for ancient Israel. How does he do it for our own lives? Well, in the same way, he lets us taste the consequences of our actions. We can choose what to do, but we don't get to choose whether it works. So if you choose to pursue a life of selfish pleasure, you'll be left empty and miserable because that's the end. That's the natural extension of what that is because only God can satisfy. So you can choose the thing, but it doesn't mean it's going to work. If you choose to do drugs, you'll probably get addicted to them at some point. Now, maybe someone once addicted wants to stop and it's very difficult. God may intervene and, you know, cure them of that right away because it's something only he can do. And, you know, it might be too far beyond natural stuff. He might not because that's the consequence of it. And by natural means, yeah, it would be a hard road or so I've heard. Um, but that is something that he can be with them in, to, you know, walk with them and help them get out of that. Again, he does allow us to taste the consequences of what we do. In all things, God is a loving father and he desires to give good things to us. Now, we might not understand it at the time, kind of like a small child getting vaccinated, doesn't like the pain of the needle and doesn't understand the, be the greater benefit that the parents do understand. So God can and does do that in our own lives. He's a good father, so he gives us the things that we can't give ourselves. He does for us the things we can't do for ourselves, but he's not a helicopter parent. So he's not going to do the things that we should or can do for ourselves or do for each other. Because if he were a helicopter parent, that's not a very loving thing to do. We don't learn from that at all. God loves us too much to be a helicopter parent. P.S. Be a hero today.